Алло, привіт, чи, чи чути нас? Так, а... чутно, чутно. Інна, чи можете знову спробувати розмовляти? Так, я розмовляю, чутно мене. А, трохи погано. Зараз ми, намагатимось... Зараз ми будемо намагатися трохи звук попра... покращити. Ну, я вас чую дуже добре насправді. Пора починати, але будемо англійською. Чи є у вас якісь теми, які ви б бажали обговорити? А, трохи координації залегіть. Я не знаю, нічого з моєї сторони. Я маю приготувати презентацію, і я буду відповідати мої слайди, і також я маю відповідати мою презентацію. У вас буде презентація, правильно? Так, так. Добре, ми зараз будемо починати трохи. Прийдуть скоро люди і покращать звук, бо у вас трохи недостатньо, недостатньо гучно чутно, і є івент сусідній дуже гучний. Угу. So, hello everyone, we are about to start our panel discussion in a few moments. Hello. Greetings. Hi. Hi, Na. Hi, it's nice to see you in person. <laughs> Online, but in person. Yeah. Hope you could join us as join in person as well. Yeah. до нас долучається, зараз він трохи поправить все. Пані Інна, спробуйте ще раз розмовляти, будь ласка. Так, як зараз мене чутно? Ще набагато краще. О, супер. Добре, вже все набагато краще. Починаємо. So, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining our panel discussion on uh, youth for biodiversity innovations and collaborations for a sustainable future. And we've been like uh, Through this COP28, we've been going through many, many things. It's almost the last days uh, and uh, everyone is so busy. And sometimes we need to find uh, some moments to focus on ourselves and of course uh, on the preservation and conservation of uh, the nature that is left so far. Of course, uh, with the uh, climate crisis, anxiety, wildfires, are happening worldwide. Uh, Ukraine, uh, amongst other conflict-affected countries, are struggling to protect uh, the nature habitats and just like the natural 
the nature of Ukraine being literally destroyed right now by the full-scale invasion of uh, Russian army. And uh, of course, uh, uh, it is very difficult for many people, for people who live in villages close to the forests, uh, for just young people, and just literally everyone. Of course, anxiety is taking over, but what we can do together to come over anxiety is for sure uh, being active. Do, and we need to understand what we can do together. Uh, and today at this panel discussion, we have with us, uh, um, sorry, maybe it will be better if I give you the opportunity to present yourselves and uh, tell a little bit uh, about your projects and initiatives. Slides, slides. Yeah, there is slides. Maybe well. just like a short yeah, presentation. Sure. Everyone, for everyone, there is. Yeah, okay, I will let, no, but it's like, and, uh huh. Okay, Sarah, can can you just put up the slides? Yeah. So next slide, please. So we have Elias, who is from Ukraine, and he's co-founder of Friday for Future Ukraine, and it's like he's working on climate justice. Like a huge person. We we met at COP twenty twenty six probably, and yeah, he's he's my really good friend. And yeah, we met at COP twenty seven, and yeah, uh, that's it. <laughs> and next, next slide, please. And we have Mr. Cian from IUCN, and he's like uh, IUCN Commission on Education and Com uh, Communication, and the chair, chair of that. <laughs> so happy to have you here as well. And next slide, please. And that's me. <laughs> I'm the founder of the Govardhan app. It's like the social media for biodiversity. And next slide, please. And here we have Ina from UNDP Ukraine. Yeah, that's it. Okay, that's stopped. That's okay. Now I can go back to Zoom. Zoom, please. Thank you. So we're starting then uh, with Gokul. And uh, since Gokul is a young person and uh, a young uh, innovative and entrepreneur. Maybe you can tell a little bit about uh, your project since like, uh, what did inspire you and uh, what do you try to achieve? Okay, maybe the slides can be, sure. Yeah, thank you so much for the slides. So I want to start something. This was uh, Marcin from a Polish, uh, Polish botanist and a physician uh, who has done a lot of research in Ukraine, Poland, mm, mountain ranges like the borders. And they have found out like there is a lot of biodiverse rich uh, traditional medicinal plants, like medicinal plants is uh, which is having a lot of potential for focusing like on medicinal and also supporting the biodiversity and stuff. So he wrote something like, we are no longer satisfied by the knowledge of gardens and field plants. It's uh, like they're searching for new ones in the wild and in the forest and the mountains. And yeah, there is a lot of bio biodiversity still hidden back in Ukraine. And yeah, that is something I'm like really interested into and looking forward to and wanted to like see what as a indigenous medicine student from India, um, like, like fascinated about all of that. Like, how can we use that for healthcare? How can we bring up more such in not discovered, in discovered biodiversity, which is currently being destroyed? Uh, so, I'm looking forward for that. How can we do that? But still, I I I want to give this to uh, Mr. Sian for taking it forward so that he can tell us what the importance of biodiversity is, like, why. So, next slide, please. So, hi, everyone. As you heard, my name is Sean. I'm a Canadian and South African, and I'm honored to be here today. Maybe you all don't know what IUCN is, so maybe I'll very quickly go an overview of IUCN. It's the name International Union for the Conservation of Nature is not that well known but it is the world's largest network of environmental groups. Yep. Next slide. Um, it, uh, 
1,500 member organizations, many based in Ukraine, uh, governments, NGOs, indigenous peoples, city governments, and an uh, increasing number of youth organizations, plus 1,000 staff in 45 offices and seven commissions. I happen to chair the Commission on Education and Communication, and we've been a big part of helping put youth where they should be meaningfully in the middle of the IUCN uh, world. So we had a big youth summit in uh, the run up to our youth Congress in Marseille and um, honored to be with these two esteemed leaders here. Uh, I, I couldn't feel better positioned than between the two of you. Um, my particular role is on education and communication. So I'm gonna focus on the innovations that we've been looking at. Next slide, please. Um, and, and try and position a little bit of that in the context of the complexities of Ukraine right now. So our biggest program we run is called Nature for All. And it works with a very simple idea that when you are connected to nature, when you love nature, you protect it in a much more intimate and profound way. I bet you if I asked my two friends here when they fell in love with nature and how they fell in love with nature, we'd hear an amazing story of being outside, maybe with a family member, maybe with a teacher. Um, if we had time, maybe we can play this game later. But um, the challenge when you have a conflict zone is that many of the opportunities to get outside disappear. And in a context of anxiety and fear, all of that opportunity for connecting to nature becomes much more difficult. It's hard to engage people. And we're at a climate change COP, so why am I talking about nature at all? And really, the we in IUCN believe there are not two discourses, two crises happening. There's really one that's combined. It's a biodiversity crisis. It's a climate crisis. And frankly, it's a social justice crisis. And conflict sits right in the middle of that confluence of, of need. So we, next slide, please, um, created our four groups. These are the specialties we have. You'll see that youth and intergenerational partnerships is one of our four priorities. I think we're manifesting very well here the youth and intergenerational partnerships, that would make me intergenerational, just in case it wasn't clear. Um, and I wanna to touch a little bit more on Nature for All. So please on the next slide. We now have 600 member organizations who are each doing different things to connect people to nature. Uh, if you go to our program in Colombia, you'll find grandmothers, outdoor grannies, who have taught themselves about nature and are taking their grandchildren outside. It's so popular that now grandfathers are insisting to join. If you go to Canada, where we have a lot of new immigrants, you have people learning to camp in an urban setting before they can go out in the mountains. So they come into a nice building like this, they put up a tent, they make their first fire, they make some marshmallows, they get comfortable before they go out. We have 600 organizations all doing different things. We strongly believe that the answers to most of the problems are out there already. And they're often embedded in youth organizations and youth led initiatives doing remarkable things. We believe in surfacing those codifying, sharing, and letting other partners learn and run, modify, do their own work. Next slide. Another thing I wanna to touch on here, and again, it's money. Money is really important. And if we look back at the Global Biodiversity Framework signed a year ago in Montreal, education and youth were in there more than ever before. Um, the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, the equivalent of Yongo on the climate side, really work to, to embed these issues. And countries are responding. My country, Canada, is putting hundreds of millions of dollars now into nature education. There's been a lot of discussion of education here at this COP. And I think in response, we'll see hundreds of million dollars going to climate education. My worry is there's only really one education. 
And we should be doing education that combines climate, combines uh, biodiversity and nature all in one place. And it's formal, informal. It's creating new pathways for young people to enter the, the workforce. It's service learning. It's not just a narrow definition of education. It's a 360 which recognizes often the teachers are right beside us in youth-led initiatives, not just in teachers. Next slide, please. One thing we're really exploring a lot is the role of nature itself in education. And we're promoting something we're calling nature-based education, kind of nature-based solutions in the education space. And it's really trying to explore the idea that society is increasingly distanced from nature. 70, 80% of the world now lives in cities, harder to get outside. We have conflicts like Ukraine, like Gaza, where it's very difficult to enjoy nature in a in a the bounteous way it should be. If we redefine what nature is in the educational system, we'll recognize that nature is the classroom. We need to be outside to learn. When And we'll talk about nature, green classrooms in a minute. But also nature is a teacher. And that the, we should be learning from the systems we see in nature, the resilience, the, the mosaic of, of cooperation we see. We look at a healthy ecosystem, it's 80, 90% in cooperation and only a small element in conflict. Sadly, in the world, we see conflict hugely dis disproportionate to the amount of cooperation we see. We have our first ever IUCN position paper on nature-based education. You can find it on IUCN's uh, platform. And uh, we'd love to explore with you in the framework of Fridays for Future and your work in Ukraine, what that might look like in a conflict scenario where life is particularly difficult. Getting close to the end of my slides. Next, please. Want to talk just a little bit about green classrooms. And I know it's hard to talk about green classrooms when your classrooms are being bombed. But we need green classrooms. We need students to be outside. And we know from research now that there are so many advantages to children learning outside from K to 12 all the way. Play is essential to growing up. We know there's health and welfare be well-being benefits. But we know there's also climate and biodiversity benefits that happen. A lot of the money that's currently going into greening schoolyards is actually climate money. And we see uh, one of the few places of synergies between climate and biodiversity there. Community engagement. The city of Paris, for example, made a commitment based on the new heat waves they've been experiencing to make green schools part of the community's place to get cool. And all 600 um, schools now in Paris are what they call green oases. Lastly, the educational benefits are clear. When you look at education of children outside, it gets way better. I will close um, with my next slide, just in saying thank you for being here. Uh, IUCN is honored to, uh, to be led by youth. And as we go to our Congress in 2025, which will be really close in, in Abu Dhabi, I hope we'll be able to work with both of you in building that youth movement. And hopefully by then, we won't have a conflict scenario. Uh, thank you very much. And really, like, I remember those days when I have been in university, I think, uh, not just like uh, in the first years of school. I felt like there was like this good nature vibe, you know, spring is coming after the after winter. You want to enjoy it, but you have to be in, in in the lecture rooms and feels like uh, not so comfortable but of course we need to learn any system we have for the moment i remember those days uh, right now i'm based in berlin as a refugee i remember those days uh, when i have been in kharkiv i often see in my dreams like parks uh, and how i have been like spending time with uh, my friends, certain of whom are no longer alive, unfortunately, today. It has been one of the best uh, times. And, you know, surprisingly, each time 
a building like my university got gets destroyed I, I was of course sad but when it has touched a park or the garden a little bit the garden of the house of my mother I have been very very sad and of course, I remember these years of uh, environmental activism in Ukraine, how we at least tried to figure out what nature habitats, uh, what uh, landscapes, uh, steps we have. Uh, and so far, we only had like a high level, nothing on so far on low level, we had high level, uh, like certain uh, biomes are migrating more not uh, the certification and i remember some ngos like eco action have been working with undp and this is here maybe where we have questions to to inna from undp ukraine about the projects uh, that are happening right now how did they change si since before the full scale invasion of Russia on Ukraine and after the full-scale invasion, what are the gaps? What are maybe the areas of focus? It's uh, next to it's uh, your turn. Uh, please, next slide. Hi, now can you hear us? Uh, greetings, colleagues. Uh, yes, I hear you well, uh, and maybe. Uh, I can share my screen now. Yeah, that'll be better, I think. So we can see both of, both the screens at the same time. Okay, good. So now it could be in presentation mode. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. Good. So... <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm really uh, very happy to be part of this discussion, um, as well as a participant of such uh, very high-level climate conference and this panel, uh, especially. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and uh, one slide back. I would like to mention several points about uh, projects uh, where I uh, have involved in. Uh, and um, present a few slides uh, about overview of the state of biodiversity, the variety of war impacts and steps taken by uh, our projects towards biodiversity conservation. Uh, so, um, to the start this discussion, I would like to mention that Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine uh, since February 24 has already caused and continues to cause uh, really enormous damage to people and infrastructure in settlements where hostilities uh, continue. Uh, but war also affects uh, wildlife and nature as well. Um, and uh, first of all, I would like to highlight some general, general preconditions that existed in Ukraine before the war and continue to impact nature today. First of all, this is uh, incomplete information on biodiversity within the country and some gaps in knowledge regarding species, habitats, rare species, etc. The reason for this situation is the lack of biodiversity conservation strategy and action plan on national level and also a fragmented species monitoring system. Uh, in fact, uh, monitoring of species took place within the framework of uh, scientific programs of certain scientific academic institutions. And uh, there was no, some, how to say, general, general system to data collection, of data collection, uh, data storing, or general requirements for the collection of such information. Uh, the second important point to mention uh, is the uh, inability for scientists to research the current state of species and habitats due to the inability to conduct expeditions to many territories due to hostilities, mining, lack of access, bombing. Uh, all um, that I've mentioned leads to the fact that the data we have about the impact of the war on biodiversity is not accurate, not well-structured and not complete. 
but nevertheless, in this presentation, I will try to present the information that is currently available. So my next slide about the impact on landscape and habitats. Uh, here, I would like to use just official information came from Ministry of Environmental Protection and Nature Resources of Ukraine. Um, so at the end of November, more than 2,900 cases of environmental damage were recorded in Ukraine. Uh, this is uh, at about uh, 56.7 billion euros in the rough estimation. Uh, Russia's armed aggression caused 150 million tons of additional emissions of GHGs, which is also important fact uh, to be mentioned in uh, this discussion. Every day of the war increases this indicator. Uh, one third of Ukrainian land is mined. Uh, 174 square kilometers is not just a number, this is a simple number. Uh, it is an era that potentially pollutes the ecosystems. Uh, since the start of the war, Russia has launched many missiles and drones over Ukraine. They are um, exploded uh, in Ukraine, but the chemicals spread over thousands of kilometers. Uh, and also other countries suffer from this uh, as well. Uh, today, uh, today, uh, fighting is taking place on the territory at about uh, 30,000 square kilometers of Ukrainian forest. Forest fires cause a double impact on the climate. On the one hand, we face the loss of the CO2 absorption potential of forest. On the other hand, during the detonation of rockets, several chemical components are formed. Uh, for example, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, formaldehyde, etc., etc. It should be taken into account that the shelling harms industrial enterprises that use various chemical substances in their activities. And uh, these are also tens of thousands of tons of harmful substances released into the atmosphere. Uh, at the same time, uh, polluted air has no borders. Uh, emission into the atmospheric air, which were caused by the military aggression of the uh, Russian Federation on the territory of Ukraine, transfer and uh, have an impact on the territories of other states, um, sometime at distance of thousands of kilometers. Uh, and uh, last point uh, concerning this slide about Ukrainian water bodies. Uh, Ukrainian water bodies are polluted, actually. Because of this, there is a risk of deepening the water crisis and food crisis we have. Uh, according to the United Nations Office uh, for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, about uh, 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 about um, uh, 13 million people in Ukraine need help to access water and sanitation. Uh, and uh, fi uh, final final uh, word from my side to this slide uh, about mine explosions. Uh, mine explosion leads to soil contamination with heavy metals. Uh, I mean strontium, titanium, cadmium, nickel, this makes soil dangerous and in some cases uh, very unsuitable for further agriculture use. Uh, explosions also cause forest fires, as I said, so we return again to the problem of emissions into the atmosphere and uh, food security. A uh, few words about protected areas. Um, as a result of uh, Russian armed aggression today, we have more than 800 protected areas with a total area uh, at about 0 0.9 million of hectares, uh, which were affected. It's about, at about 20 percent of each protected areas in the country. Uh, another few numbers, uh, 2.9 million hectares of territories of the Emerald Network, which potentially could become uh, Natura 2000 uh, network, are under the threat of destruction. Uh, 160 territories that are part of the Nature Protection Network of Europe and uh, are protected within uh, also EU and uh, could be protected under the legislation uh, of EU if uh, Ukraine uh, will be lucky enough to join European Union. Also, there are 17 wetlands of international importance 
uh, protected by uh, Ramsar Convention. Uh, I'm sorry, one slide back, just to finish. Uh, 17 wetlands of Ram uh, Ramsar Convention um, are situated in the risk zone and more than 500 objects uh, of the nature reserve fund remains occupied, which is also very, very important. Uh, and uh, here I would like to pay you attention to two pictures uh, in my slide. Um, two wetlands of international importance were practically destroyed. Uh, this is Veliki and Mali Kuchuhure Archipelag and Stim Mayakiv floodplain. Uh, and the entire protected area, more than one and a half uh, thousand of hectares, the most valuable steppe area on the General Hatch National Nature Park was destroyed. Uh, habitats of species of flora and fauna listed in the Red Book of Ukraine, IUCN, European list of uh, species, globally endangered animal and plant species have, have been damaged. Uh, back to few cases about the impact on wildlife. Uh, definitely this war destroys wildlife. Uh, living creatures either die or try to escape from the hot spots of hostilities. Uh, so for a common understanding what the consequences of the invasion of the Russian Federation into Ukraine can be, I will give you such few examples. So uh, when in 2015 Russian troops began to use uh, Krivakasa protected area in the Donetsk region for landing, all bird diversity disappeared there. Based on uh, NGO Ukrainian National Conservation Group information on this protected area, rare pelicans, uh, Pelicanus crispus, uh, which are included in Red Book uh, of Ukraine, started nesting uh, on the territory for the first time. The colony counted uh, 70 pairs. Uh, the uh, number of magpie waders uh, also, which are included in Red Book of Ukraine, also increased there. And the number of red listed uh, terns in this place reached approximately 60,000 of pairs. All these nesting groups disappeared at once in 2015, when the Krivakosa began to be used by Russian troops. As a result of the occupation, the National Park Inspectorate stopped working. In the following year, only terns continue to nest there in small numbers. Uh, another example, you probably heard about this example. This is really um, big case in modern history. Uh, I mean uh, destruction of the dam on the Kachovka Reservoir. So as a result of the destruction of the dam on the Kachovska uh, Reservoir, significant damage was caused to fish stocks. According to the same uh, NGO, in particular, no less than 43 species of fish were counted there, of which 20 species are recognized as important species for commercial use. Annual catches were up to two uh, 0.6 thousand tons. Also, um, there um, were some uh, rare species, but we have not uh, enough data to understand uh, some changes. Wintering sites were also affected, uh, and it will take at least seven or from seven till ten years to restore such fish stocks. Um, and generally speaking, as a result of the explosion of the Kachovka uh, HPP dam, certain organisms died or uh, after some time, died immediately or after some time. Um, also, what we have, um, other organisms were carried into the sea and also died within certain time, for example, frogs. Also, such a massive release of fresh water had a negative impact on the inhabitants of the salty water sea coast. And uh, last, um, last case, last example from my site about dolphins. Everybody uh, loves dolphins, but dolphins continue to die in the Black Sea due to hostilities. Now, the last case we have uh, on July uh, 29, Several dead dolphins were found on the coast of the National Natural Park, Tuzevskilemane. 
since the beginning of the war, 32 uh, dead dolphins have already been found in part of the territory of these uh, protected areas. Uh, finding of dead dolphins on the shores of the Black Sea are recorded mainly in its uh, western part. Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine, and unusually large number of cases have been observed since uh, February. We are talking about, uh, generally, generally, right? We are talking about several hundred confirmed photo and video cases on the shore. Uh, on which, as of today, more than 100 are in Ukraine, mainly in Crimea and in the south of the Odessa region. Uh, the total number is still unclear. Data collection is uh, ongoing. One of the hypotheses regarding the cause of such event is acoustic trauma. But uh, anyway, scientists are currently searching for the uh, exact cause, uh, and the search will continue for some time. About uh, other impact, um, sometimes uh, not only the negative effect of war um, affect nature, but nature can additional benefits uh, unexpectedly through uh, reducing the negative impact of uh, humanity from of human. Uh, for example, everyone knows the exclusion zone of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, uh, the territory which people left due to the radiation. Uh, due to the pollution after the accident in uh, 1986. This case turned into a world example of how nature can recover in certain era where all human influence stopped there. Uh, now, uh, this exclusion zone is the largest wild hotspot, I would say, for all uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, a Basile Reserve has been created there, uh, and many scientists seek to get to it for the purpose of studying wild, wild nature. Uh, in say, certain territories where no uh, direct action takes place, a certain positive, I would say positive, limited positive, right? Impact is uh, observed due to the, uh, first of all, reducing the impact of intensive agriculture, uh, agriculture practices, no uh, insecticide, no pesticide there, uh, prohibition of hunting, uh, and uh, prohibition, general prohibition of human access to the uh, territories. Just uh, it's about reduction of disturbance factor. And last but not least, I'm personally working for the um, Global Biodiversity Framework uh, Early Action Support Project uh, with the Ministry of Environment Protection and Natural Resources of Ukraine. We are currently working together on nature um, biodiversity strategy and action plan, as well as uh, exact, very precise scheme of biodiversity monitoring. Uh, in parallel with that, I'm currently working in another project focusing on support uh, of Ukraine in achieving uh, NDC, uh, National Determining Contribution to the Paris Agreement, uh, through climate change adaptation and mitigation planning trainings, promote, uh, promotion sustainable livestock management and ecosystem conservation. Also, we are currently working on developing a very first monitoring, reporting and verification protocol for assessment GAG fluxes in peatlands. Uh, uh, from all uh, I mentioned above, uh, it can be concluded that after the end of the war, it is necessary to immediately proceed to the restoration of the damaged areas and think about the best way uh, of uh, conducting it now. Uh, of course, uh, active citizen and youth play um, a big role in this process. Uh, young people can be positive agent uh, of change and represent a valuable potential that governments and institutions should invest in. Uh, because of youth um, are significant force for sustainable development and key agents for so social changes, economic growth and uh, technological innovation. Uh, in our project, we promote and support their empowerment. This is done by uh, promoting uh, full uh, inclusive governance, increasing youth participation in decision-making process, engaging youth in peace building and gender equality programs, and ensuring youth are a part of CDG's uh, integration, implementation, and monitoring. 
So that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ina. And uh, it was very insightful and like uh, very nice to see you here. And maybe hopefully we see you in, at next COP or SB on place. Uh, yeah, I mean, so many, many things uh, to explore, so many, many things uh, that we have to understand, label, target, uh, understand what to do with it. Ukraine is almost as big as uh, Turkey, just like 100 square kilometers difference, and like the biggest country in Europe after Russia. And obviously, we have uh, quite a lot of those lands, uh, and we need for sure to, pre to preserve them. I remember in Fridays for Future Ukraine, across the cities, uh, we had a lot of uh, different local issues. And we started like even initiatives uh, across local groups in Ukraine, in many cities and villages. So like uh, it's probably sounding like basic and like uh, why it is still present in the 21st century, but in Ukraine we also have this problem of, uh, uh, I don't know, hazardous randomly uh, uh, appearing uh, trash uh, in the forests uh, in different areas. And the solution for this was social media. But uh, since social media helped uh, many young people in Ukraine and like just activists and civil society to find uh, and target the issues maybe we need not only to speak about uh, problems in ukraine because so far i i guess we don't have just like problem with gar random garbage uh, and uh, pollution of uh, like industrial pollution that has reduced during the war uh, maybe we need to change the focus from just uh, targeting the issue maybe we need to have the big picture of what we want to preserve. And for this, like many civil society and people are very thankful to NDP and for the environment ministry in Ukraine in trying to categorize uh, the, the habitats and natural areas that needs preservation and conver conservation. And here we heard at COP27 when I met uh, Gokul uh, 20, yeah, I mean, 27, you came and started presenting your project very strongly. But yeah, since COP26, uh, maybe 25, <laughs> uh, yeah, we, uh, like, uh, I heard that Google had a project, like, uh, where people can categorize and put in, like, uh, the knowledge, like, local knowledge, maybe indigenous knowledge, depending on the region, what uh, kind of uh, plants we have in Ukraine, uh, what plants we have in Ukraine, other areas, what is good about them, why it is good to support each other. And about all of this, uh, I give the word to Goku. So much for that. So, uh, uh, so uh, can I go through the slides? Hi, Sarahi. Ah, okay. Yeah, okay, next one. Okay, so it's called the Govardhan app. It's like the world's first ever social media for biodiversity and indigenous medicinal knowledge. So we wanted to connect uh, people back to nature. That's the main thing we wanted to do and also preserve the indigenous knowledge. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, it's like we want to, uh, we all use social media right now. And we come up across a lot of good things and also a lot of bad things. Similarly, we wanted to use the same structured data of like a social media to connect back to nature as well. Next slide, please. So like people wanted to know why the, like, the value of the nature is. So here we want to use like, we want to connect the bar. There, there is a barrier uh, for us to know the nature. 
because most of the researchers and stuff like that happens in scientific name like for a mango in our in our community it's like scientific name magifera indica but most of the local people or for people from the indigenous communities or from the ground level doesn't really know the name or doesn't understand the name so if it's very really hard for them to like find information about why the plant is so important or why is it there like other than on a scientific basis like yeah so in my local area it's like called manga man manga something like that in malayalam so we wanted to bridge that gap by using a social media we wanted to give a username to every single plant and animal out there so that it's like uh, every user who joins in can give a username to their plant it's whatever species it's it belongs to whatever scientific name it has but it can we, they can give a username to the plant so that they actually name the plant and yeah next slide please so it's like a social media itself like instagram for like instagram itself so people can join give their own username to that plant like you can say cat like wild and wild cat and dog of the street that is a dog that i saw in the street so i didn't, didn't know the scientific name just gave that name so that people in my community can use the same username i can share that same username with my friend hey i named this dog as dog of the street you can also uh, join in and put information about seeing that dog around your around the community next slide please so this is sandal uh, sandalwood from india so uh, yeah it's we are trying to collect, uh, collect information about how indigenous people are using the plants as well so here sandalwood or chandana is something which called chandan chandana in in our community so i give a username as chandana and the name the local name as little bit everyone knows is sandalwood like english name and also the scientific name which if i know i can add it's like optional now if i know it i can add that to the profile if i doesn't know it's okay because uh, the local name and the username is enough for me to share the information about what i know about that plant in the community so that everyone can contribute so someone posted about yeah they use it for disease called uh, for disease for omitting so i have separate tag for that so that everyone in the community who is searching for remedies for vomiting disease can find out that this plant is used for this and yeah for vomiting chandana plus another plant which is amlaki so it's amblyga officinalis and like gooseberry so juice is given according to ayurveda so uh, people can share the information in this plant so it comes up in the page of the plant so people can understand the value of the nature next slide please and also we are collecting information when the person clicks a photo their data there is a metadata in the photo itself like where is the location so why should we just waste that data we can collect that information and put that in a map and show the world that our biodiversity is not just a protected area but around us and around the community itself so we have like different icons like people when they see someone something from like a mammal or a aquatic creature or something like a shrub herb or something like that or if you spot something which is related to deforestation or like forest fire or something like destruction of nature they can also map that in the city map so that people who knows you recognize that in the map it's like follow based system only the person who you, who you follow will appear in the map so yeah so we wanted to share information about like that so it's like official about the local community next slide please yeah this is something i had to show an example this is like a train a train station i i was in and i saw a, like a crow which was handicapped so i just made a, po a post about that like it's a crow i saw it's little, uh, you can't see that it's like what i wrote it's below so yeah uh, so people who follow me can see that crow icon over there and just when they click on that they can see what's the biodiversity over there it's some social media stuff like that next slide please and yeah we are also like uh, using the same thing we are collecting information about how medicinal like medicinal value the plant, plants have so that we can showcase to the community that this is why the plant is so important you should protect that and we all are like on like 
we are all like have have to protect our nature because it protects us and we need to protect it back as well because if it doesn't exist then it's like we are also gone so are collecting information about chemical compound like we use different tags like chemical compound tag if you know about the chemical that is involved in the plant like which helps in for this kind of things we are this is turmeric and turmeric is, it has some qualities which helps in alzheimers so yeah i'm um, just uh, so people can use the hash tags here like slash for curcumin and mention the disease so that um, we are building an ai model so we can go through all this information that people are people are going to post uh, about plants so that we can come up with health in, uh, like new innovative medicines as well in the future is planning on that as well so next slide please next slide please ah, okay so i want to just say that uh, every thing that came to us like in, in indigenous medicine like modern medicine it had a back like history which is from indigenous medicine and still right now people in our communities say that indigenous medicine and modern medicine is like two different things it doesn't connect at all but i can can you can you guys show me the line where where we can divide the these two like from biodiversity and indigenous knowledge and stuff because actually people think there is a difference but actually you can't draw a line between them because in the modern medicine comes from indigenous medicine itself so uh there is a need for us to go back to like see our indigenous knowledge biodiversity and protect that if that doesn't happen our modern medicine also will not be enough for us as like the new kinds of things are coming up like amr antimicrobial resistance and much more is coming so yeah we need our indigenous knowledge and also we need our biodiversity still to be intact rich and enriched so that we can protect ourselves next slide and that's it from my side and you can use that link to you can find me and looking forward to connecting with iucn as well <laughs> and working together i don't know how our time slot has has been allocated like we have time right yeah, yeah. maybe uh, i would like to engage uh, maybe maybe you want to engage with each other maybe you have questions on your uh projects uh, our their listeners are also welcome to ask questions if they have any i saw some like links because like like uh, the like uh, all the presenters uh, work on something common it's identif identification of uh, natural uh, no, not resources like habitat and natural nature and we have macro level probably in UNDP with some focus to some regions uh, we are um, i mean do you see, uh, Fox, any potential for, I don't know, common projects or, I don't know, collaborations? So I, for me, it was very, both presentations were super informative. Seeing this data on the environmental damages in Ukraine from our, our excellent colleague from UNDP, really powerful data that made me think a lot. Just teasing out that one data point of a third of the land is mined. Just imagine the second biggest, third biggest country in Europe, and a third of it is mined. What does that do to your feeling of being outside, your confidence walking in nature? And not just now, but for years, if not decades to come, you will have a new fear of being outside, which is so sad for children, for, for adults, for that relationship we have between parents and children who love to take their... So I'm very struck by the, the power of data there and the importance of knowing the facts as we go into these scenarios. And then going to this other story where you can name things what you want to name them and the creative and the imaginative space um, also data and this power of citizen science and this I'm a huge fan of citizen science because when you get your hands dirty and you get involved it changes your relationship so for me there was 
a lot of ways that a group like IUCN, which is data driven, but also looking at empowering youth and stakeholders could work um, on both sides. But I, I'm particularly fond of your app because for me, uh, naming is a powerful thing. And when you name something, you own it and you take care of it and it, it changes your relationship deeply to that thing. So I think it's a very clever way to engage. And it's, uh, if you go to iNaturalist and you stick in and you look at a plant, it gives you the scientific name and it's very nice, it's great and it's got a lot of uses, but it doesn't engage you to come back and learn more and, and, and engage in a deeper way. And I think, yeah. um, we have a question from, uh, we have a question from our listeners. Can you present yourself? And... <laughs> yes, my name is Christina Stevens. I'm with Revolution Love and uh, Glocha, which is a Swede uh, an Austrian NGO, um, Ecosoc. So, uh, yeah, I have a question because oh, my heart goes out. I walked in here and I just kind of, my heart just opened up because I know what you're dealing with and we're talking about the environment and your environment is demolished. And, you know, I was, I wanted to ask uh, uh, the teacher here, <laughs> if you are, are working on any curriculum uh, for healing in, in traumatic zones, in troubled zones, education for those who are in harm's way, who are going to need healing, like now, immediately, you know, um, and regenerating the souls as well as the, the poison of the bombs and, and the mines and the death, you know, replanting and rebuilding the spirits uh, in school. I mean, I, I think these times really call for a curriculum that really attends to that because that's kind of critical now. I mean, and we're needing it not just in Ukraine, but definitely in Ukraine. Uh, and then, you know, there's also you, um, the, uh, you know, I was sitting here and, and you're talking as if there's not a war almost, you know, but I, I, I love uh, the citizen science. I thought that was fantastic. Uh, and I'm wondering, because I noticed that everything you had is from India, and I'm wondering if you are not in connection with youth in Ukraine to identify, you know, the any any of the the plants that are indigenous to them because they're going to need to restock, rebuild, replant in their country, you know? I mean, it would be really wonderful if even they could begin to having the thought now of let's rebuild, even though you're under siege, uh, the thinking of rebuilding uh, is a very positive one. And if we can begin to walk that path, uh, I think when the time is right and you're ready, um, uh, I feel that, you know, we can move very quickly. I mean, how many millions and billions of trees are we going to have to replant in Ukraine? And what species are they? What trees will we? Because they're going to clean the water. They're going to clean the air. They're going to do a lot. You know, they're going to bring back and help bring back a lot of the land there. Uh, but, you know, I love your citizen side because I think, I think you can also, you know, be a teacher to the youth there and sharing, and that's also a curriculum, sharing what you have in India and, and co the corresponding herbs and plants and the benefits of what they have there, even though, you know, there are mines, so they have to be very, very careful of where they go, uh, you know, collecting. But um, anyway, uh, my heart is really heavy when I walk in here, so I, and I want to get lighter. So in wanting to be lighter, I want to kind of see a curriculum that will help the children, and I want to see activities and everything that will help rebuild the nation, uh, begin to rebuild. Even in the hearts and minds, if we start rebuilding now, it may hasten the, the process. I don't know. Um, do you have responses? Okay, so right now, thanks for the questions, and thanks for being here. And yeah, so for me, I'm trying to do that. It's just my initiative started right now and I'm building the app myself. Uh, so yeah, it's like zero funded and stuff, but still I'm pushing it forward, pushing it forward as much as possible for me. 
so it's like zero funded and i'm doing it myself uh, so i have my friends across the globe like is like they are also, like helping me out in friday for future uh, friday for future here in ukraine uganda and like a lot of people i have been like doing this uh, side event on like egypt pavilion nigeria pavilion uganda pavilion here like a lot of pavilions uh, helping me out to spread the word about the importance of indigenous medicine and i'm uh, very hopeful that my initiative is just started out like one it's just been one year but still yeah we are going i'm going ahead like that with with all my first friends supporting free me from around the globe so i'm hoping that yeah it, we will develop soon and we'll make a network to make people understand the value of biodiversity and yeah i'm sure yeah i'll give this to also thank you for being here and thank you for letting your heart into the space for me um you ask a really profound question and it really goes to the way we view education these days and i am old enough that when i was a young child my parents threw me out at six in the morning and we came back after dark there was no fear there was no trauma there was wildness there was play there was celebration in nature now we live in a society where you know there's danger is the modus operandi of a parent and Curriculum is now about compartmentalizing things into STEM and science. It's not integrated. It's not holistic. It does not take place outside. I saw a very interesting presentation this week from a, a, a leader in Scotland. And when we think of Scotland, we think of mountains and, and valleys and green. 82% of schools in Scotland are cement or moat grass that's not the way to change a child's heart if you want to change curriculum you have to bring nature back into the curriculum so that's why we're promoting what we call this nature-based education and, and i think it's a very powerful way to take on conflict too in a framework of love and connection we're much less likely to to enter into conflict scenarios and it happens in the way we we educate our our kids from the time they're born. So I I think the healing happens when you put children outside, and the prevention of conflict is when we're connected to nature. No, it's not a great answer, but that's the best I can do. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. I mean, uh, yeah, we had our our grow our growing up was very very different. The consciousness now it has elevated and nature is a healer you know so and in ukraine right now and i'm here in ukraine as i stand here um i'm needing healing if i was a, a little a little person um uh, you know in africa you know the children there needed healing and there are some schools there that do have curriculum that is based on healing trauma and bringing, you know, strength and identity and and confidence back to a child that has been, you know, leveled by fear, you know, and that's about love. Fear is the opposite to, to love, not hate. So, uh, yeah, the nature based, but I think there's a hurdle that we need to get over before we can get back into nature, as you said, all those landmines. Um, but just planting one tree, you know, um, I, I'm on the board of the Captain Planet Foundation and we, uh, we have gardens all around, we, we plant gardens all around the world for children, you know, to learn how to, how to grow something, but also how to grow a tomato because they think tomatoes, especially in the United States, they think tomatoes come out of um, McDonald's. They don't know that tomatoes grow on a vine and you can grow it and actually take it home and, cut it and eat it. Uh, so you know, that's dealing with that. We're dealing with something pretty much different. And I, I, I my sense is that in, in terms of education right now, we, we really need to, to leap into that in the land of Ukraine, just because of what they're experiencing. So, yeah. Thank you very much. And, uh, I'd like to add I'm something back. as well. I miss my childhood as well. Like, you know, in my childhood, I used to be uh, in my village which was like 
very great we had like rivers we used to form groups and go to the rivers uh play with the water and also like go through the nature and like uh, i still remember like my mom says don't go to the nature like go, go outside you will get your like hurt or something like uh, you will get, get dirty or you will be diseased or something like that and she, she used to not let us outside but now i really miss that like now now the rivers that used to flow through there is like really polluted and we don't know how we if we enter we we'll, we will step in something like something like a glass bottle or something in the water that we can't see so we never we could now now trust we can't trust the nature now we can't trust the nature now and enter the like enter the nature so yeah that's a sad situation anything like yeah like the pollution is too much and we can't yeah like uh, due to the pollution due to the pollution we can't trust that what uh, lies under the water like this glass bottles glass waste particles that can hit us if we enter the uh, step into the water in the wrong way yeah Yeah. Rebuild nature. Demolished. Yeah, I understand that, and we are trying to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Indeed. Yeah. I mean, with the war, like I said. Okay. I studied architecture and we have a bad joke uh, in like pro bad professional joke in architecture like war is bad but war gives more opportunities to like more work more things to build but I build I believe uh, war in Ukraine uh, the Russian full the Russian full scale invasion on Ukraine all the war crimes happening uh for awful and like there is no words like. I've cried for more than like a year and a half over losing my friends and I'm still sad, but there are no longer friends here, but the garden is still here. The, that forest is still here. And I feel the same sadness to know that something is no, no longer here because at least I could have a base, at least like, you know, someone dies and like there are places that reminds of those people and Russia is literally erasing them, not just only removing monuments like for Holodomor or destroy, removing coats of arms of Ukraine, removing many, many cultural things, even destroying like, like I mean, they destroyed an entire theater with people in Mariupol. Like they're destroying, they try to destroy our memories. But of course, uh, resilience uh, we can find resilience in being connected together and this is what i liked in the idea of this app you can save it you can share it with people you can share good moments you can share awareness moments like uh, with uh, like what activists can do there is another app called chili app and activists uh, try to do campaigns there maybe we can think of something in ukraine uh I don't know, Ina, are you with us? Maybe. Um, yes, yes, I am here. I am, I hear you. Yeah, just I maybe. Know. I am. I am sorry. Maybe I, mean, I didn't ask you this before in the coordination, but maybe you know of any UNDP department or. I heard that UNDP in Ukraine are conducting a range of projects assisting NGOs, CSOs uh, 
to advance uh, certain sustainable goals, including natural conservation, or and at least getting the data to understand what we need to do. And I heard uh, the Youth for Climate project in Ukraine is closing soon. And maybe you know if there are any chances for young drive young driven initiatives like in both private sector, public and like civil society sector, are there opportunities and chances to engage? Um, what I know is that uh, we have actually a three portfolio in uh, UNDP Ukraine, and uh, I definitely know that uh, another portfolio, this is um, uh, development peace building uh, portfolio, uh, is working closely with uh, youth uh, and have very strong partnership with uh, local uh, NGOs, uh, especially with uh, is focused on youth. Um, I'm not sure uh, about the name of the project and uh, some uh, time and other um, other features, but what I know for sure is that they are clo closely working with this uh, category of people. And maybe... Um... So, I, I, um, I... It's not working. <laughs> My past, I spent 12 years with UNDP, so it's nice to be on a panel with you. And I, I love the UN because you stay in in the good times and you stay in in the bad times. And what is so critical in a time like this is to keep an eye on the diagnostic of what's the damage, where is there still resilient species, where is there people who can who can make the shift when the shift becomes possible. So I want to commend you for continuing the, the good work. Um, but what is that process that you see underway to understand the, the negative impacts on environment and the plans that will be put in place once the, the conflict uh, ceases, how quickly will it be possible to bring the resources, the people, the finances to bear to not just rebuild the, the needed theaters and schools, but also rebuild those forests and get rid of those mines and get people back outside? Um, maybe uh, I would like to tell you one example when this work uh, is started. Um, it's about uh, Kahoka Dam disaster. For example, for this uh, precise case, UNDP Ukraine and uh, other UN agencies um, uh, carried out some um, needs assessment, post-disaster needs assessment, uh, and it was done um, uh, adding uh, also experts from Kiev School of Economics and uh, uh, adopts the UN, um, EU and World Bank methodology. Uh, this assessment, what I know, uh, focuses on disaster affected areas and uh, also uh, examines not just physical assets, but uh, indirect impact uh, of uh, biodiversity, direct and indirect uh, impact of, on uh, biodiversity. Uh, so we have some numbers, we have more or less a precise uh, assessment, uh, and, uh, it's quite scientific one, and uh, it uh, could serve as a basis for future rebuilding. And also we have uh, like general approach, building back greener, <laughs> that's also important to have such a guiding star to uh, do such rebuilding after the war uh, finished. Thank you. Yeah, I I have a question because I'm part of UNDP Rome Center. They uh, they have a collaboration with the. It was called Ministry of Ecological Transformations of Italy. Right now, it's like something else. Uh, Youth for Climate, and I heard they are like they act on international level. And my friend from Morocco. I'm half Moroccan. My friend from Morocco, he won a, a micro grant uh, in the, and he simply wanted to create a 
like we have this in Ukraine everywhere, but for Morocco, maybe it's new, like a, a greenhouse, a greenhouse project for his school. And he won a micro grant for this. And I maybe you know what uh, what are opportunities in youth, maybe, I don't know if it's the Rome Center or the center in Turkey that is in charge for micro grants uh, for projects in Ukraine, because I mean, uh, well, we're not competitors, but I think there are points of collaboration in Ukraine for sure. And uh, worldwide, since like the app uh, can be like uh, universal, and I really don't think it's a for-profit project since it's community-based. Uh, uh, as okay. well, it's like uh, it's a uh, it's like global thing right now. So people from different countries, like uh, uh, Caribbeans, Canada, UAE, are helping me out with documenting data as well. So I don't I don't think it's like based in a particular region. So yeah, we can scale up like we are all um, like there is a lot of organizations which are interested like. Right now, Ayosin is here, and he's also said he's interested. <laughs> and also, we I I went to like CERN, the Large Hadron Collider over there, and they were also like really interested in the project, and they wanted to help me with the like a KT knowledge transfer at the CERN. They were interested in uh, including it in the medical innovation stuff, and yeah, we are discussing the you know uh, like uh, how how can the partnership be like a collaboration be. So yeah, I'm thinking about how we can take this forward, but I'm also like. Uh, yeah, how how impactful it will be? How can I do that? Like still figuring it a little bit out as well. Like yeah, that's the situation right now. And I have a question to UNDP as well. It's like how can an individual help out, uh, like a youth person, uh, being out there, reach out to you guys. So if you are working in a biodiversity bio, biosphere, uh, like from a di different country, or yeah, how can uh, we apply for like reaching reaching you out yeah um i would like to answer like uh, on two level on global level we have un youth initiative and special um communication channel when people young people especially can uh, ask um, um, local office uh, to participate in several activities this is one way how to proceed and uh, uh, for example from my experience in my um, project my two projects actually we are focusing um, especially for this uh, audience so uh, for example if we are inviting people to our trainings to our uh, workshops we try to reach young people as much as possible so it uh, what is done from our side so it's like two two layers of uh, my answer okay thank you so much for that answer I'd like to ask one question to you as well. So what did you like um what did you feel like what did you learn about like about the session today? What was it for you? What did you take like taking back from this select like, youth and biodiversity and innovation? Thank you for asking. Well, actually I I don't know why. I was thinking that I will be very sad, but I'm I'm feeling very happy because like uh we had this conversation that I like I was thinking about it many like it's the second year going that I'm thinking of how to solve this issue and here like I see some kind of hope and some prize we can try to hunt. Like I mean not prize prize, but maybe there are grants and things like this, but like grants are not here, just as grants. We need solutions. And I find like the idea of the social media, like given that we have official data that like we are uh C R E how do you, you say I'm sorry. The Greek, the, well the species survival, the red list oh. is a great <laughs> Yeah, sorry, it's like end of cup. So IUCN and like UNGP and I think uh, local projects in Ukraine also work on finding this data and as an uh, activist uh, we're more as activists we're more thinking how to 
catalyze this information, how to provide it in a very simple way to people. But right now, it's not uh, the government of Ukraine. We need, we still need to hunt those other areas. Uh, sincerely, I think how we can make partnership uh, and share this idea with others in Fridays for Future Ukraine, because like it looks like innovative and in this digital era and like, uh, I don't know how to call Zoomer, like the Generation Z uh, in Ukraine, like the main uh, the main people we try to target uh, as Fridays for Future, they would for sure understand this. I remember you report uh, you report uh, Ukraine uh, where more than one third uh, of like no two thirds of people consider that youth should be taking part in resolving climate action. I've also learned like from you report uh, it was a you you report in twenty twenty one that uh, like 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 like. Okay, it's only six thousand of people who answered, but the answers uh, were surprisingly good. However, people in your like young generation in Ukraine consider that they need instead of just striking in front of ministry or I don't know Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine that we need to do something systematic, like uh, influence certain policies. Uh, gather information but of course as I worked with people who are like of age of 13 14 uh, the question of policies is a little bit difficult so how to engage them how to engage uh, like the early teenagers uh, to do something and this app uh, looks uh, like a good idea I think thank you so much for the replay I have one question for seen as well uh... Is IUCN happy with me changing, uh, giving a username to every single plant and other youth project that you guys support? And I wanted to know more about like how youth can from Ukraine or global, like Ukraine or India can join IUCN and support as well. Yeah, that's it. Um, so I would say the Species Survival Commission, the one that does the red list and documents all the plants, have a huge interest in going national and going local. I know from Jean-Paul Rodriguez that these global assessments are nice, but when you get national groups involved doing the assessments, it becomes really more powerful because you create a community of activists working together. Uh, for me, there's always going to be the scientific codification, and then there's the engagement factor. You're not doing the science side, you're doing the engagement side, but I'm sure you're, I think, from what I saw, you also give the potential to bridge them. It can be, you call it manga, but here's the technical name at the same time. IUCN has seven commissions, 17,000 volunteers around the world. Each of those commissions have opportunities for young people to be involved. Over, in my commission, over 30% of the participants are youth. Um, each of the commissions has its own youth strategy. We have a youth engagement strategy across all of IUCN and a youth advisory committee that guides us and leads us. So join a commission, get involved. Every year we have um, different webinars and things. It's a chance for you to present your work. I leave very inspired by hearing at the end of a very chaotic COP um, where you know there's not always a, a lot of good news to see two amazing people doing work, uh, practical work on the ground. So I wanted to thank you both. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe you know you have questions to us because we keep like making inquiries to UNDP person. Maybe you have inquiries yeah. to us. Um, no questions so far, maybe just to a quick uh, reaction to, uh, not to uh, right now, uh, Sean said, but uh, during uh, her presentation, he presented, uh, we are also working on uh, conservation of uh, IUCN um, significant species. This is more than 10 significant in uh, IUCN dimension species. 
uh, and uh, also met many, many obstacles uh, in that. But maybe uh, if uh, you have a share your expertise, uh, we'll be very uh, grateful for and beneficial for our project. Hopefully, uh, well, hopefully we keep in touch and see options, hopefully. But this discussion uh, was cre clearly enriching. Thank you, everyone uh, who's watching uh, this video, probably uploaded on YouTube, and uh, for asking questions and listening. Uh, we're, I guess uh, everyone is here open uh, to hear collaboration opportunities. Thank you, Inna, and everyone here. Thank you, Inna. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for the Ministry of Ukraine for giving us this opportunity to host an event. And thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining in. Thank you so much for IOCN for joining in. Thank you so much, UNDP Ukraine. And yeah, thank you so much for everyone watching as well. And thank you so much, everyone. Bye.